Good morning, friends. It's my privilege to welcome you to our scripture ministry lecture. Our lecturer today is Professor Daryl Bach. Dr. Bach serves as the Executive Director of Cultural Engagement, as well as Senior Research Professor of New Testament at Dallas Theological Seminary. He's well known to all of us. He's the author and editor of over 40 books, a wise and articulate uh, spokesman on a whole range of topics, extending beyond New Testament studies to ecclesial and, and Christian living sorts of issues. We're thrilled to have him here today and excited for what he has for us. Let me uh, offer a word of prayer and then have you join me in welcoming Dr. Bach. Lord, we give you thanks for this day. Really, truly grateful for your watch over us, your care for us, for this opportunity. We pray that we will be properly attentive and learn what we need to learn and be challenged and edified. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Join me in welcoming Dr. Paul. Well, let me begin by um, praising you for the absolute warm welcome that I've had here in Chicago. Uh, the white carpet outside was really exciting to see as I landed at O'Hare. And the extension of that carpet across miles was, uh, I can't say a mild surprise, but I will say we don't get this in Texas. It's a good thing because Texans' attitude towards ice and snow is the faster I get through this, the better. <laughs> and uh, it's a bad strategy. So, um, and, and let me apologize for something before I start. I'm going to be up and down as I speak. My back is not doing very well today, and I'm in a little bit of pain. So, um, so I'm going to be struggling to find a comfortable uh, position to speak to you from. So sometimes I'll be up and sometimes I'll be back, and I usually probably will be more back than forward, and it looks like I'm kicking back and relaxing, but that's just so I can think uh, and read as opposed to um, just be aware of the fact that we're all um, quite mortal which is a nice thing to talk about when you're talking about Adam, because um, he's responsible for um, the dilemma that I find myself in. So let me dive in. The title of the talk is called Thinking Backwards About Adam in History. And uh, one other caveat at the start. Um, I had originally planned in writing this essay to go from the New Testament and work back. But then in actually producing it, I decided it was better to take on a different strategy. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through the Hebrew text of the Old Testament outside of Genesis and then work through the intertestamental Jewish materials and then come to the New Testament and then jump back to Genesis. So we're still going to work backwards. It's just not quite in the way I had originally envisaged when I gave him the title. So with all that as a caveat, and with deep appreciation for the invitation to be able to speak uh, into this project, um, what most of you probably don't know is that when uh, the Templeton application was made for this project, um, I was one of the outside examiners that the Templeton people called upon to say, what do you think of this? Should we give them our money? So you should be grateful to me, <laughs> okay? So uh, here we go. <laughs> All right, efforts to discuss the genre of Genesis 1 to 11 get us into conversations about whether it is kind of prehistorical, symbolic kind of presentation. Often it is said we need to appreciate how ancients view this kind of material before making prejudgments of our own. This is a very fair question to raise. To get at the answer, one needs to ask, how did other ancients read this material? What category seems to be at work for them? So how was Adam seen within the canon and among early Jews? This is an appropriate procedure for those who see Scripture as an inspired text. For the reading of scriptural texts, even over time and across the canon, gives us a glimpse into how these texts were understood by those who shared in these ancient cultures. Inspiration argues that God superintends this presentation. The question is how they were read and what signals did these texts give about how they were comprehended and received. 
The point about cultures is also important because we are speaking about multiple cultural contexts across centuries of time. Is, is this material being read consistently across those cultures? So I will include some Jewish texts that are not a part of Scripture to trace the impact of the foundational Genesis texts, yet another angle on how ancients read these passages. Do these passages treat the figure of Adam and Eve as symbols or as larger part of the accounts about Israel's origins? Is there a consistency in how they are handled? Is there any indication from them raising questions about or giving clues concerning how these texts are seen? My plan for this lecture then is to work backwards to the Genesis text, looking at the Hebrew and Jewish text first and then the New Testament. That may seem an unusual way to proceed. However, since the New Testament uses, uses also often appeal to Jesus, who is not a symbol but a real figure, some groups set aside, it may be important to see if anything changed working backwards and what place uh, was in place when Jesus appealed to such contexts and when Jesus is being appealed to in such contexts. So first, I will list the text to be covered outside of Genesis. For this, I will proceed in the normal working order, working out of the Tanakh to the Second Temple text, and then to the intertestamental material, and then to the New Testament. We note this was with an initial listing, providing brief comment on a few texts that lack detail and can be quickly addressed. A detailed look at the fuller passages comes next. We close our discussion with a consideration of Genesis texts themselves, then deal with objections in terms of handling these passages. So first, the initial listing of texts before the New Testament. Once we move outside the references to Adam in Genesis, the citations are extremely limited in the Hebrew Scripture. It's actually a little bit of a surprise. In fact, the only clear example is in a genealogical list in 1 Chronicles 1.1, where an apparent historical genre is in view with names extending beyond Genesis 1-11. to Nothing about this listing suggests that names we tie to persons in history outside of Genesis 1-11 to are being handled differently than the names found in the opening book. And that's also true of the names that come outside of Genesis and Genesis 1 to 11 and extend up to the point of 1 Chronicles. It starts with Adam and Seth and Enosh in verse 1. When the list gets to Noah, Shem, Ham, and Jephthah, it follows a distinct yet selective listing of the sons of each in verses 4 to 17. Once we cross the figures of Genesis 1 to 11 and get to Abram or Abraham, nothing about the listing changes as the sons of Abraham are listed in the same manner as the sons of Noah in verses 27 to 34. It includes the seemingly strange sequence of listing the names in one order the first time and discussing them in the reverse sequence. So Shem and Isaac are listed first, but their descendants are listed last. Isaac and Esau are also handled in a similar juxtaposed sequence. All this would seem to suggest that the figures of Genesis 1 to 11 appear in a light similar to figures from Genesis 12 onward. Hosea 6-7 involves a disputed reference that can read, like Adam, they broke the covenant. This would be a comparative reference. For the term Adam, however, there is discussion. Four possibilities exist for rendering this term. A proper name, like Adam, which it rarely means. A collective singular, like men. Isaiah 2.20 is a collective use, and that is by far the most common use in the prophets, Psalms, and Proverbs. A proper location, at Adam, referring to a city in the Jordan Valley. Uh, and also amending a comparative cough to a, lock, a locket of bait or for a metaphor meaning like dirt. Thus, although it is possible Hosea points to a specific figure, it is very much less than clear this is the case. Compounding the issue is the use of the term as a generic term for a person, making possible a symbolic use for the term referring to mankind in general. But let us note how this generic symbol works. It takes the name for a person from the first person made in the Genesis story. So what came first, 
the person or the term? And those of you who are young will remember the question, so what comes first, the chicken or the egg? I'll let you make the call. It is, is it because individuals together can be called Adam that Adam is named and portrayed as a single individual in a kind of origin story in Genesis? Or is it because the first person was called Adam that the name extends to all humanity after him made in his likeness? My only point here is that the argument for a symbol can cut both ways and settles nothing by itself. Add to this the point that the name itself is a variant on the term for dirt, that an origin in the creation event itself may be present even in the name, and interesting even more, even in the symbol. Second temple texts and uses just after this period are also instructive. Sirach, a book in which you probably did not have your devotions this morning, 49.16 refers to Adam as honored above every living being in creation in a list of several chapters with other biblical figures inside and outside of Genesis 1 to 11. It comes in a section where Enoch, Shem, and Seth are also named in verses 14 to 16 of chapter 49, and where Enoch is described as taken up and the other two are also called honored. Much like the genealogy of 1 Chronicles, figures coming on down the list of fame come from beyond Genesis 11. The list actually starts five chapters earlier, in Sirach 44.1 with the refrain, let us sing the praises of famous men, our ancestors in their generations. After an overview, we start with Enoch and Noah, then Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Moses, Aaron and Phinehas follow, then David and Joshua, the judges and Samuel, followed by a return to David before discussing Solomon, Elijah, Elisha, Hezekiah, Josiah, moving to Ezekiel, Job, the 12 prophets, Zerubbabel, Nehemiah, and concluding in chapter 49, verses 14 to 16, with Enoch, Joseph, Shem, Seth, and Enosh. Hike, and please send me the ball. It's a, quite a list. As with earlier listings, the name at the last of a sequence is prominent, and this is Adam. This appears to group Adam among other known figures across several chapters, this fits with the naming of Adam in the genealogies as early as Genesis 5, and Jubilees also treats Adam as a, new, as a known figure in Jubilees 2 to 4, mentioning him several times, as well as in 16.8, 1924, 1927, 2213, and 50 verse 4. First Enoch does the same by counting generations from Adam in, in First Enoch 60 verse 8. And 4th Ezra 6 and 7 does the same as it describes the events of Genesis 3. So let's take a look at some of these texts uh, beyond the ones I just mentioned. Tobit 8.6 says, You made Adam, and for him you made his wife Eve as a helper and support. From the two of them the human race has sprung. You said, It is not good that man should be alone. Let us make a helper for himself. That's the end of the Tobit passage. This reading is clear and direct as to how this author sees Adam. Jubilees, 1st Enoch, and 4th Ezra also deserve a closer look, and we will give them a closer look in a little bit. In fact, we'll go to Jubilees straight away. The book of Jubilees has many references to Adam. In chapters 2 to 4, in defense of the centrality of the Sabbath, the book retells the story of Adam in the midst of presenting the six days of labor to create and the seventh day to rest. The author, uh, the author speaks uh, following, speaking of chief men from Adam until Jacob in 2.33. The, the Ethiopic simply reads, until him, but it's clear who the him is that's being referred to. Jacob is the referent, and so the translation in Charlesworth names the referent. Again, the point is Adam is part of a chain of figures, all seem to be part of the same history. In a clear addition to the Genesis account, the author places the events of Genesis 2 in a second full week, arguing Adam saw all the beasts, cattle, birds, and everything, naming them, yet was alone, 3, 1 to 3. The creation of his wife from his rib comes next in 3, 4 to 8. 
There are some tensions in how this account tries to render Genesis 1 and 2, but it is clear the author sees these figures as not mere symbols. The author of Jubilee speaks in 3.8 of how she, that is Eve, was created at the end of week 1, but was not shown to him until the end of week 2. It's one of the ways harmonization between the two chapters is achieved in Jubilees. The length of issues tied to impurity are rooted in this story as well. The fall and the murder of Abel by Cain with Adam and his wife mourning the result of the murder appear in 4.8. Jubilees 16 in verse 8 looks at the sins of the time of Lot and says such sin had not been committed from the days of Adam until his time. Again, the time after Genesis 1-11 to is treated like that of the time before. Jubilees 19.24 has Jacob as part of the blessed line, including Shem, Noah, Enoch, Mahalalel, Enosh, Seth, and Adam. I'm glad we don't name most of our children after the names in the Hebrew Scriptures. The idea is repeated in 1927, where Adam, Enoch, Noah, and Shem are named as the previously blessed ones. Jubilee 22.13 has Isaac bless Jacob, appealing to the same blessing he gave to Noah, God gave to Noah and Adam. Finally, in Jubilees 50 verse 4 comes the law of Jubilee, counting the years of Jubilee back to the time of Adam as totaling 49. Nothing in any of this sees Adam only as a symbol. First Enoch 60 verse 8 is similar, describing Enoch as, the quote, the seventh from Adam, the first man whom the Lord of Spirits created. The final Jewish text we consider is 4th Ezra 6 and 7, which laments the damage done by the fall. The text is more complicated as one reference is well attested in the manuscripts, while several other remarks are not in some of its manuscripts. The clear text is 4th Ezra 7:11, a verse I'm sure you will memorize as a result of this lecture. In a divine report about Israel's history, the text says this, quote, For I made the world for their sake, and when Adam transgressed my statutes, what had been made was judged. And that's the end of the citation. There's a clear allusion here to the fall, and this is seen as a specific event about a specific person. A longer passage appears only in some manuscripts. Fourth Ezra 7 Verses 116 to 124, alternatively numbered 46 to 54, and I have no idea why that's going on, says this, quote, I answered and said, this is my first and last comment. It would have been better if earth had not produced Adam, or else when it produced him, had restrained him from sinning. For what good is it to all that they live in sorrow now and expect punishment after death? Oh, Adam, what have you done? For though it was you who sinned, the fall was not yours alone, but ours who are your descendants. For what good is it to us if an immortal time has been promised to us, but we have done deeds that bring death? And what good is it that an everlasting hope has been promised to us, but we have miserably failed? Or what that safe and healthful habitations have been reserved for us, but we have lived wickedly. Or that the glory of the Most High will defend those who led a pure life, but we have walked in most wicked ways. Oh, that a par or that a paradise shall be revealed, whose fruit remains unspoiled, and in which, abundance and, in which are abundance and healing, but we shall not enter it because we have lived in perverse ways. That's the end of the passage. This is possibly the most detailed text on the fall in early ancient texts. The impact of Adam's sin is specific and widespread. Again, the figure is not read as a mere symbol, even though what he did is seen as passed on to humans as a type. In these texts, we see two clear patterns. First, in genealogies and in other listings involving the history of Israel, Adam is treated as a figure like others of her history, such as Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, even David and Solomon. Second, he is portrayed consistently as the first male human, with Eve as the first female human. The idea of a family unit and of the fall are two events tied to his existence, 
It is this kind of context that brings us to text in the New Testament. And just as an aside, I'll say, what this means is there are three specific events tied to Adam in this material. The creation of Adam himself as the first human being, the creation of Adam and Eve as the first pair and their relationship to one another and why Eve was created, and the fall. Those are the three events that get appealed to. Okay, let's take a look at New Testament texts. When we come to the New Testament, references are also few, but the pattern we have seen appears to be picked up here as well. As with the Hebrew Scripture genealogical lists, there is one in the New Testament that mentions Adam. It's Luke 3.38. A listing takes us all the way back to Adam, referring to him as son of God, because God was directly responsible for his creation. That genealogy runs through figures like David and Abraham as well. The pattern we saw in 1 Chronicles, Jubilees, and Sirach appears here. Some texts can be treated very briefly. Job 14 counts Enoch as the seventh descended from Adam, which fits what 1 Enoch does. 1 Timothy 2, 13 and 14 treats the fall as an event speaking of the deception of Eve, like 4th Ezra and Tobit, that refer to the fall, although while not mentioning Eve. I have a theory for why the fall and the blame for the fall ends up falling on Adam, but I'll leave that for the question time. Interesting references are in Jesus' discussion of divorce in the synoptic parallels. So this is Matthew 19, 3 to 12, which equals Mark 10, 1 to 9, Romans 5, 14, and 1 Corinthians 15, 22 are our two other texts. They require more attention. In the divorce discussion, we do not get the mention of Adam's name, but we do get the description of an event that sets a precedent for how Jesus thinks about divorce. Jesus cites a man leaving his father and his mother and cleaving to his wife and becoming one flesh as the point of the design of marriage, setting a precedent, a legal precedent, for why it is designed by God to be a permanent bond in contrast to divorce. The citation is of Adam and Eve's original union, which is said to have extended from the beginning, Matthew 9, 19.5 and Mark 10.6. Precedent is usually not made by appeal to a meal symbol, and the timing element also in score, uh, about the beginning also underscores the point of how Jesus saw the couple. Romans 5 and 1 Corinthians 15 each apply a typology contrasting the death that came with Adam with the life that comes with Christ. Romans 5.12 speaks of sin entering the world through one man, dia enos anthropu and death coming to all people as a result. So the reference to a specific individual seems clearly tied to specific results. In Christ, tied to a specific person, reverses in Adam a relationship tied to an individual and his acts as well. Romans 5.14 goes on to say, death reigned from Adam to Moses, making the same comparison of figures point that the Hebrew scriptures and the Jewish text made of old in which figures inside Genesis 1 to 11 are related in a similar way to figures outside of Genesis 1 to 11. Adam, these figures and their actions are seen to belong to the flow of history. Adam is described as a type here, but only in the sense that his actions impact the reality for humanity. So also the sacrificial act of Christ does the same to reverse what Adam brought. The point is not that we all transgress in the same way that Adam did, but that such sin makes one culpable of death as it did for Adam. Underscoring this is Romans 5.16, as this text notes that death and combination resulted through one transgression. In 5.17, the transgression of the one, to to enos parapatomati, allowed death to reign through the one, dia to enos while in 519 refers to the disobedience of the one man, dia tes parakoes, to enos anthropu. This also is not a reference to a mere symbol, even though Adam is identified as a type. This is the one whose actions at the beginning impacted the direction of the rest of humanity's story, 
a story only reversed by the equally historical and significant act of the Christ. The entire image is also found more succinctly in 1 Corinthians 15, 20 to 22. In verse 21, death comes through a man, de anthropu, just as resurrection came through a man, de anthropu. The parallelism is completely balanced, even as there appears the reversal of two real events and two individual people. There is one Christ as there was one Adam, so the attempt to argue 1521a is generic fails as the next verse also shows. The next verse has all die in Adam as all are made alive in Christ. The resurrection to life is as real as the first sin that led to the fall. To this is added in 1 Corinthians 15.45, the creation of Adam as a living person, a reference to the soul, in contrast again to Christ, created as a life-giving spirit, a reference to Numa. Here the figures are referred to specifically as the first man Adam, ho protos anthropus Adam, and the last Adam, ho eschatos Adam. The comparison is balanced and the figures are treated as of the same kind, historically tied to real but contrastive actions with opposite impacts. All of this is to justify the resurrection is real and essential to faith, making its opposite the same and that it establishes the basis and need for what Christ supplies. Again, a symbolic or merely generic reference is very unlikely here. This means that both Jesus and Paul are on the same page when it comes to how Adam is utilized as a precedent-setting figure of the beginning, one in the tie to marriage, the other in the tie to the fall, sin, and redemption. Acts 17.26 has a similar starting point in noting that all the nations come from one. Epoiesen te ex enos pan ethnos anthropon. This reference actually does raise a potential ambiguity, since it could mean that out of one ethnos come all ethnoses, I don't know what you call the ethno, plural of ethnos, ethnoi, but the background we have traced and the clear allusion back to Genesis seems to be against that reading. We likely have another allusion here with the contrastive typology with Jesus being the counter parallel. Everything we have seen in the New Testament looks like what we saw in the earlier Jewish text. Figures on the outside of Genesis 1 to 11 are paralleled with Adam, Moses, and Christ. The time frame for Adam is the beginning. The events are marriage and the transgression of the fall. Eve is handled similarly in terms of the fall. The real event of the resurrection and the merging new life become the contrast for the first sin through the one man, the first Adam. The reversal of the death of Adam caused for those made in God's image comes in the resurrection and new life that comes by faith in the, and new life that comes by faith in the second Adam who provided an equally historical hope. Now, in the words of Chris Berman, back, 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 back to Genesis. So what, Chris Berman's a great theologian, so what in the book of Genesis produced such meetings? Looking at the genealogies, Genesis 5 has a genealogical list that mentions Adam. It starts by notion, noting the creation of humans in the likeness of God, gives the length of life as 930 years, said he had other sons and daughters, and died, 5, 1 to 5. Tied to this is the role of other genealogies in Genesis. In Genesis 11:10, this genealogy picks up with Shem and runs to Abram, verses 10 to 30. The point about the individual figures after Genesis 11 being linked to figures in Genesis 1 to 11 surfaces here. A point we saw in texts like 1 Chronicles 1 and Luke 3. The story of origins in Genesis develops a family line that is narrowing to Israel. Three events dominate the account of Adam and Eve in Genesis, and I'm repeating something I've already said. First is the creation of humanity as male and female, both in the image of God during the creation week, with rootage of the Sabbath in that work. They are to steward the earth well together. Second, there is the naming of Eve and the origin of marriage. Her creation gives the climactic gnomon of the creation and culminates in the un union that makes for marriage in the family. The man is not to be alone. He recognizes this as his naming of animals has made him aware of his need of a helpmeet. 
Her creation and their union meets his need for a companion as together they work to carry out that mandate to steward the creation well together. Third, there is the fall. It shows what happens when stewardship goes wrong. The failure, this is the point I was going to make about Adam and Eve, the failure with regard to the fall was joint. But the responsibility emerged when Adam failed, making the collapse of their mutual support complete. The story of the first couple becomes the story of us all, gifted with opportunity and responsibility, yet fallen. The action is not merely a symbol, but it is a prototype. All three events surface in these later texts at one point or another. Sirach highlights the honor of Adam, created as the first. Tobit discusses the creation of both the man and the woman. Jubilee speaks of the parallel with the Sabbath. Fourth, Ezra focuses on the fall. Jude dates Adam as the first of seven generations removed from Enoch. First Timothy 2 reviews the fall and Eve's role in it. And Acts 17 looks at the origin of all from the first person. And in the most extensive New Testament text, Adam and Christ are contrasted and compared simultaneously. Compared in each being the head and the gathering point for a community of people. Contrasted in the one act that led to damage for humanity, while the other leads into restoration for them. Now I deal with objections. The following walk through, the following walk through does get pushback from some. Pushback is my formal word for objections. That walk through is not so much for the content of what has been raised, but to the entire approach of the question. It is made by an appeal to Genesis as an understood archetypal reading that produces a literary Adam versus a historical Adam. In part, the goal is to accommodate the genetic and other science that argues the lack of a sustainable single ancestor model alongside an old earth. Just to be clear, what we are contending for here is not a denial of the old earth model or even the prospect of biological relatives to humanity before Adam. Our contention would be that with the creation of Adam in God's image, God acted in the creation to place a link to himself that represented a fresh stage in that creation. We should be careful to rule out God stepping into his own creation for a God we believe is active in history through Jesus Christ and does minor things like resurrection. It is in the context of theological hermeneutics that Scott McKnight's biblical discussion of a distinction between a literary Adam and a historical Adam becomes important. The order of our discussion is also important. Historically, Christians have regarded the distinction between natural revelation and special revelation as significant. Natural revelation is how we read the material world around us for what it tells us about God, and that reading is not regarded as inspired, at least in the way special revelation is. It is described and it is discerned to determine what's going on. Special revelation is inspired by God. Now, as history shows, we do not read that revelation infallibly. So it is always important to ask what special revelation is saying to us. It is also fair to do so. So I want to consider the category distinction McKnight contends for as he discusses the theology tied to Adam. Is Adam an archetype only? Might one contend he is an archetype who also is a historical figure? That's another possibility. And how might one make a distinction, and should one do so if one is to make a distinction? It is here where I think Scott and I read the text distinctly, and Scott's a good friend. I believe the biblical text and the history of how those texts were read shows that Adam is both an archetype and a historical figure versus being a literary figure only, making him a symbolic or some type of vaguely defined in kind figure, an archetypal cipher only for humanity. We have already looked at both biblical texts and other contemporary readings out of the same context. But, we should pro but how should we process what we have seen? I agree with Scott's four principles as stated in chapter five of his book on Adam and the, and the genome, 
where we read, uh, when we read the text first, we have to respect the speech of the context. Two, we have to be honest about the facts, both in science and the text. Three, we have to be sensitive to the student of science. And four, we have to affirm the primacy of Scripture for what it says. It actually is point four we are discussing. As a non-scientist, I cannot comment with any expertise about the science. So I will stay in my lane and not try and cross my pay grade. I don't get paid enough anyway. <laughs> However, note this. When science speaks on issues of origins, there is a great deal of theory and hypothesis about how it works, especially when claims made by Scripture that God has acted in the midst of those sequences. When there is recognition of God's ability to act among scientists, it does come with an awareness that tracing that ability is something science cannot confirm. So I will plead with science to stay in its lane and in its pay grade. Science in its attempt to recover the history of the past is limited in what it can do. Material evidence struggles to cope with spiritual presence and reality. This is because those actions are a part of God's special activity distinct in many ways from national revelation. We might see its consequences or be able to see its effects, but we cannot materially review its presence, something that's required for science, as none of us can recreate its original environment. We can only hypothesize about that. Note one other thing in McKnight's hermeneutical list, the order. Like the book as a whole, the order is, let's talk about principles tied to science before we go to the text. Now this is not necessarily a problem, as one of the checks in thinking through this process is to posit some level of unity between what God has done in the material world and what He has done at His own initiative. But the distinction between natural and special acts remains. Special acts are disclosed in the revelation God gives us. Resurrection is such an act, and so is creation, however it is conceived theologically. That should include signals the text is making that the text is making such a point and indicating such an event. Those signals is what I would be looking for in discussing the hunt for a possible distinction. So now we turn to the textual discussion. As Scott argues for a distinction between archetypal or literary or genealogical Adam as opposed to historical Adam, an important question is, how can we see that that distinction exists especially when there is the possibility they could overlap. One category needs to exclude the presence of the other category for its distinction to work. In particular, sorting out how we can have a genealogical atom, but not a historical one, becomes important for this conversation. It is here our texts raise a question. As McKnight worked through the ancient Near Eastern texts, he rightly noted that some elements look parallel and some challenge those narratives. He was looking at creation kinds of ancient Near Eastern texts. Genesis is a book of a series of roots, including the origins of Israel, an entity that has archetypal features of the people of God, but also is about a nation showing literary, showing literary and genealogical does not automatically exclude the historical. The fact that we have genealogical listings in Genesis and 1 Chronicles would seem to point to the fact we're in the same kind of reality and genre whether we're discussing Israel or the period before. These listings go back to Adam. The archetypes in these chapters are firsts, not fictions. This is often, this is often how archetypes can work. The cross has an archetype in the Passover. Redemption has an archetype in the Exodus and in the original, crea and in the original creation as it moves to new creation. Archetypes can and often do come with historical prototypes. Now note what this observation about not being a fiction does not address. It is not addressed if there are some form of material precursors to Adam. One thing science does tell us is that life shares certain kinds of properties between species from less complex to more complex. Scripture indicates categories of life as well. It contends that God was involved in, actually, in actively generating these categories. The Genesis 1 text merely presents Adam as the first of his kind, being made expressly in God's image 
and being given and created with the ability to relate to God and to manage the creation in ways other beings cannot, what I would call the stewardship factor. The focus on the role of image is also part of Genesis 2, breathing in Adam the breath of life. I make this observation because McKnight's listing of seven things entailed in the historical Adam on pages 188 and 189 of the book may not be what the category requires, and that definition is another key to making his argument work. Here is the list of seven things. First, two actual and sometimes only persons named Adam and Eve existed suddenly and as a result of God's creation. Two, those persons have a biological relationship to all human beings that are alive today. Biological, Adam and Eve. Three, their DNA is our DNA, genetic Adam and Eve. And that often means four, those two sinned, died, and brought death into the world. Fallen Adam and Eve, these are all Scott's categories. Five, those who passed on their sin natures, according to many, to all human beings, Sin nature, Adam and Eve. You're getting the sense that Adam and Eve have a lot of faces. You're right. Which means six. Without their sinning and passing on that sin nature to all human beings, not all human beings would be in need of salvation. And seven, therefore, if one denies historical Adam, one denies the gospel of salvation. And the emphases that I have in the text in italics are his, but you can't see them, so it doesn't matter. I have some quibbles here with some of the attailments McKnight notes. The historical, do historical Adam and Eve require a sudden existence? Is not the key to the Bible's description of Adam and Eve creation less about biological relationship than the image of God element, a characteristic appearing nowhere in McKnight's discussion here? Is not the point about death, about spiritual death, versus all death? Is not the passing on of the sin nature about a tendency to choose wrongly when faced with responding to the way of God? Is not our culpability before God for salvation a function not just of the nature we receive, but the choices we also make, making that culpability our responsibility? He then goes on to argue, it is not clear Paul supported points 2, 3, and 5 in his list, though he does accept it as likely that he does hold points one and four. Can, still, we can work with his seven points. Here is what in my thinking is key. What existed suddenly in the creation has to do with the, with the presence of the image of God in beings that make a human a moral being, a creation God is said to be responsible for, introducing directly, and who becomes directly responsible to God as the steward of the creation. The capability to choose wrongly and in a way that alienates from God also came with that specific aspect of creation, a failure Genesis 3 portrays. It holds Adam responsible in part because Adam and Eve were paired together so they might help each other in that responsibility. Both together make up the fullness of the image of God. When Adam failed, both sides of the human image pairing failed. The original creation uh, of image in diversity failed, impacting all sides of the human image equation. Romans 5 seems to park on that moment and that choice as to what makes humans moral, culpable, and in need of a Christ to reverse the damage done, whether it is because Adam sinned or because all sinned like Adam did. This failure portrays neither a mere symbol nor merely a metaphor of comparison, but an event in kind, archetypal for sure, but also a real and failed response. The type resides precisely at the point at what makes people human and in need of redemption, beings with accountability to God, beings who can choose otherwise at their own peril, just as the scene involving Adam shows. So when Adam does show up in Jewish scripture, in Jewish literature, and in the Hebrew scripture, it is often but, all, but not always with this event in view. In several texts, when the lists of saints are noted, he is included in the listings where other figures are not distinguished as being literary or genealogical versus historical 
but as all these categories at once. Fourth Ezra 7, 118, I cite, O oh Adam, what have you done? Jubilees 4.10, Adam knew Eve his wife, and she bore nine more children. Sirach 49, as part of a much longer listing, including mention of kings, but closes with this, above every other living being was Adam, close quote, after having mentioned Shem, Seth, Enosh. Josephus, in Antiquities 1, 34-51, reviews the entire Adam and Eve sequence at the start of his history from creation to the fall. Second Baruch 54.15, quote, Adam sinned first and brought death on them all. 56.5 and 6, this is the transgression Adam the first man committed, for when he sinned, untimely death came into being. Paul is not historicizing anything here. He is reading these texts as others from his context did. He's reporting on what took place, something Acts 17.26 also does in passing in Paul's speech at the Areopagus, something Jesus also implies when discussing marriage in Matthew 19.4-6 and Mark 6-9. The archetype is a prototype, a historical prototype. Much of the content analysis McKnight makes is correct in terms of the themes highlighted, but he seems to put asunder what the text keeps together when it comes to portraying the core events of human creation and the fall. The prototype is found in the nature of the creation and the poor choice eventually made. God initiated the creation of Adam in the likeness of God's image, unlike anything before him. Adam completed the rebellion of the image when he acted in conjunction with Eve. We are like Adam because we are like a real Adam. We rebel as he rebelled. Everything about that statement would seem to require a real being, not just an everyman. Christ undoes what Adam did because Christ did some because Adam, let me read that sentence again. Christ undoes what Adam did because Adam did something concrete, not merely symbolic and not merely in kind. All our texts pointing to this scene argue this way. I am contending that the key thesis on page 190 is a non sequitur. Here is the claim cited in a remark on Romans 5 by Joseph Fitzmaier, which Scott cites with approval. Paul treats Adam as a historical human being, humanity's first parent, and contrasts him with the historical Jesus Christ. But in Genesis, Adam is a symbolic figure denoting humanity, so Paul has historicized the symbolic Adam of Genesis. It is the but in this sentence, but in Genesis, Adam is a symbolic figure that is an injection of an interpretation that is not a given, but the question we are examining. The issue is not whether Adam is a symbolic figure. He surely is. It is whether he is only a symbolic figure. All the textual evidence surrounding the early readings of this text from the cultures tied to it say no. What has been posed as an either-or is a both-and. Paul does not historicize Adam. He enshrines the history of Adam's act in a context where Scripture comes first and returns to this event as a marker. McKnight's hesitation to accept Dunn's description of his position as myth reflects the no-man's land his argument puts him in. The question begs, why not call it myth if there is no historical event in view? Literary Adam without historical Adam makes McKnight's distinction from a mythic Adam a distinction without any real difference. And so, as much as I uh, appreciate much of what McKnight says about Adam, in the last key step, the argument comes up significantly short, both in terms of genre analysis and as a theological statement. And finally, you can breathe a sigh of relief because I have hit the conclusion. This brief overview of how the term Adam is used points to a consistency of reference as the name is tied to genealogies and specific historical events of an individual. The canon appears both internally consistent as well as fitting the larger ancient background of the history of how the term Adam was applied to a figure. If we are counting Counting this consistent use, the listing of genealogies, and the remembering of specific events, 
then Adam is seen as a singular individual, at least from the standpoint of the canon and in the Jew Jewish milieu from which it came. Appeals that this is the literary Adam versus historical Adam divide what the imperial appears to present together. Some questions remain to ponder for another day. First, how do we know we are dealing only with a literary portrait in any figure appealed to in scripture outside of thinking about identifying genre correctly? The pursuit of this question has implications for how we describe Genesis 1 to 11 as a genre. Second, what do we do with a figure who shows up in lists that are embedded in clearly historical genre, as in 1 Chronicles or Luke, with other figures we know Scripture sees as historical people? Do those kinds of parallel references count as we make our assessment about genre and raise question about appeal to a literary figure only? Our essay suggests that Genesis 1 to 11 and Adam and Eve in particular are to be seen not primarily as a function of literary classification this material is myth. That description misleads us, or at least is too limiting, for what is taking place here. It may be mythic in dealing with origin questions at a cosmic and comprehensive letter level presented with a literary flair, a worldview story, but it is grounded, pun intended, in the divine act of creation that made humanity into what it was designed uniquely to be, stewards and an image reflection of the presence of God. Thank you very much. I'm okay, yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Daryl. Excellent lecture. Um, we've got some microphones. Uh, if you've got some questions, I would dare say that uh, the lecture has generated some thoughts. So we've got on both sides. Yes, please. So if we're understanding um, Adam as a historical uh, figure, how do we understand the, um, the use of Hebrew, uh, like the name is, is Adam, and then certain Hebrew terms like Ish and Isha making a significant point? When that would seem, uh, how do we understand the, uh, well, like that? Well, they obviously connect to the prototype. Uh, and um, there's a wordplay um, you know, working in the, in the prototype, in the, in the name Adam being related to dirt, picturing the creation, etc. cetera. Um, the, the question becomes, and I, I think it, it, within your question goes something like this. How much of the portrayal should we see as a photograph, and how much of the portrayal should we see as symbolic or, or a pictorial way of picturing the creation? I think that's a question that can be discussed. What I don't think can be discussed is how Adam himself is portrayed in the midst of that act of creation. So, um, so I'm willing to entertain all kinds of possibilities of how we think about the picture being created from the dust and the picture of being, uh, the picture of Eve being cut out of Adam, all those kinds of questions. But what I don't want to do is to sever, and what I think the text doesn't allow us to do is to sever the act of making Adam and Eve in the image of God as, a, as an act of God that started something new and fresh. Thank you. Others? Well, let me ask if I could, and, and some of you can think of some others. Um, brilliant lecture. I agree with it. Is that what makes it brilliant? Well, no, of course not. But, but the, the catch is this, sort of like you described. How do we move beyond, the, 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 to some degree, the, the bifurcation that exists? And, and, and how much, Daryl, do we press down in our teaching of, of pastors, leaders, teachers in the church, how much did they press down in you know, helping people understand this? Because as you, you, you know, we have young people that leave off to go to college, and the next thing you know, they they either step away from the faith or, or they, they you know, pursue, can't pursue science, one of the two. How do you engage in, that, in that, the strong bifurcation? Even, even you saying, uh, science is not my lane. Mm -hmm. How do we even carry on this discussion? Well, we carry it on with scientists. Uh, we carry it on by making clear at a methodological level what science is and is able to do, is and is not able to do. Same true with history. Uh, we carry it on by being serious about what's involved in interpretation. What I'm saying is it requires a collaboration. Uh, 
uh, would that we had an omniscient figure who could answer all these questions mm -hmm. for us. That's delayed until the return. Yeah. So um, in the meantime, we struggle in, in our fallen world to pursue these questions, and I think we have to do it in collaboration. So when I talk about this, I'm always very clear. I speak as a theologian. I come out of a theological world. I can't speak to all the science that is being raised here, but I can speak a little bit to the method of science because history and science are not completely unrelated to each other, and what science normally requires in order to establish something. Um, and I hinted at that yeah. in the paper. And so, um, and so that's a reminder because sometimes people think the conclusions of science are fact mm -hmm when some of the conclusions of science are not. And uh, all we have to do is see how theory, scientific theories have changed over the centuries to understand that part of what's going on. So a little mutual humility yeah. also might help us in this conversation. How significant is then um, uh, to have this discussion to put some things on the table of maybe non-negotiables or some essentials of, of what we affirm well, as Christians? Well, here, here is how, when, and this is true of any theological dispute. Um, here's how I tell students to deal with differences between people in, in writing how they respond to what's going on around them. I say, you need to have a spectrum, and I'm going to appeal to a theological education here. Um, and I'm struggling a little bit, so let me sit down. Um, we need to uh, distinguish along the lines of the textual apparati in our New Testament text. The beauty of a clear illustration is that sometimes it comes from an obscure place. In your textual apparati, in certain versions, you get a rating, A, B, C, and D. Most students are familiar with this. You know, A, the editors are certain this is the text. B, we're pretty certain this is the text. C, the text, the text could very well be a variant. And D, really we don't know. And I think we need to write our decision making on that kind of a spectrum. A, I'm so certain with this, I might argue with God about it like Peter did. Um, B, I'm pretty sure I'm right, uh, but you might be. C, if we get to heaven and I find out you're right, I actually won't be too terribly surprised. And D, let's flip a coin and be honest, neither of us knows. And uh, I think not only do we need to have a sense of what our decision is, but we need to have a sense of rating of that decision so that we have some way to adjudicate um, the judgments that have gone into what we decide as well as the importance of what it is that we're deciding. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, please. Dr. Bach, thank you for the lecture. Um, you touched upon this a little bit, but I was wondering if you could expand a little bit more. For those who do hold on to a purely literary atom, uh, how do they go about maintaining a doctrine of sin, salvation, man, ecclesiology, etc., that is relatively orthodox. Is that possible, or do you think that it necessarily undermines those tenets? It's a simple question. It has a simple answer. Um, the answer is yes, they, they can maintain a pretty serious view of sin, and the reason they can do that is they will tell you, look around. Sin is everywhere. Um, so, um, so the idea that we need a redemption not only has its roots in what, in the theological account that we get out of Scripture, but it also presents itself with a reality in the very world in which we live in. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. Former colleague. Uh, I'm getting nervous. Take your time, Dick. <laughs> and still a present friend. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, it was a great lecture. Thank you very much, Daryl. Uh, there's one question that's been raised in my mind recently in light of some realities in Genesis 1. Okay. When it talks about Adam, it means humanity. It doesn't mm -hmm. mean just one man because then let them rule. Right. You know what I mean? This kind of thing. It puts it all in the plural, kind of like God's name there, which is interesting. Right. But uh, how does that relate to this discussion? 
uh, in your mind uh, in terms of the one, the first, the, the man in chapter 2 and the woman in chapter 2 in, com in relation to the Genesis 1 account? Well, I think it lays the groundwork for what's probably, and this term gets disputed, but it communicates the issue of corporate personality, the one and the many. When God creates Adam, um, and he knows he's creating Eve, and he knows he's going to put them together, and more importantly, he knows they're going to come together. And he knows that when they come together, there's going to be more togetherness. <laughs> and more people for togetherness were off and running. And so the name, you're right, doesn't depict just merely the individual, but it sets up what that individual, along with Eve, together made in the image of God, are going to produce. And so in my mind, uh, it's, it's an a anticipation of the place that Adam has in the overall picture. Yeah, I wonder if it also might have a connection to this issue of God had in mind a plurality from the start, mm -hmm. and that 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 plurality may have have existed. Well, he even. certainly had it in mind from the start because the first command that he gives them is be fruitful and multiply. Uh -huh. Okay, so they aren't going to do that by just being themselves. Mm -hmm. um, that that obviously. Uh, anticipates the fact I, ha I have created you as the first to be stewards together of a creation that I want you to manage well together, whether that together involves two people, thousands of people, millions of people, or billions of people. And if you actually think about the story of the gospel and where the gospel takes us, and this I did this in a chapel message yesterday, Beyond forgiveness of sins, thought about individually, which we tend to focus on, the point of forgiveness of sins relationally is to put us in a place where we can be reconciled to one another and we can return to that creation mandate in which whether we are thousands, millions, or billions, we manage the creation well. The gospel story was always taking us not just to the restoration of our relationship with God, it was also taking us back to the restoration of our relationship with one another. That's why the great commandment is what it is. Love God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and love your neighbor as yourself. That's why the Ten Commandments are the way they are. That's why one tablet deals with your relationship with God, and the other tablet deals with your relationship to others. There is an ethical core running through this about the way we were created to function that the fall represents the disruption of, and that redemption represents the restoration of, that we are moving in that direction. And so when God said, be fruitful and multiply, he said a mouthful. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> question here? Yeah, go ahead. Um, so I had a question, especially as you're bringing up um, kind of the limits of uh, history and science in talking about some of these issues. I sort of had a question about, um, and you even hinted at some of the kind of saying that you're staying in your lane, some of the limits of uh, theology. What, um, in wanting to enter into these discussions as, um, with, with humility, what would you say are some of the limitations of theology? Well, I think I've alluded to some of them. Uh, the very fact that I don't walk in here and insist on a, on a young earth um, is an example of the fact that I am willing to entertain what I'm seeing in science in relationship to what I'm seeing in Scripture. So... Um, and what, of course, part of what that involves, which makes this discussion that we're having a completely legitimate discussion, uh, the discussion I have with Scott McKnight, a completely legitimate discussion is, it is always appropriate to raise the question, what kind of text do I have in front of me? And what is it attempting to affirm? And what is it not affirming that I might import into it as, it, as being a presentation of what it affirms? In other words, how might I misrepresent the text by how I read the text? So these um, hermeneutical and theological discussions that involve method and evidence and that kind of thing always force us not to react to hostility to a question that might challenge where we are, but to try and respond with substance to try and resolve the question that's been raised. 
And, uh, and I sometimes think that we on the evangelical side, particularly the more conservative we are, um, tend to react with kind of a relational hostility to, the, to a question being raised that actually probably deserves a serious pursuit and an answer. In light of that, uh, one uh, said at one point, uh, Judas betrayed Jesus with a kiss. Today we betray him with a hermeneutic. So it gets to some degree what you're saying. I mean, it, it, it's a significant issue. We get to talk about genre, we talk about hermeneutics, and the presuppositions with which we approach. And scientists and theologians have some different presuppositions by which we look at uh, the evidence and, and, and other things. Plus, I think scientists, they're looking for new discoveries. Theologians are hanging on to the old. Yeah, maybe. I mean, uh, I know maybe. a lot of theologians who are oh, quite okay. interested in re reshaping the way we think. Yeah. But um, I, I think, I mean, I kind of have two thoughts going through my head. Um, I think that, um, that we need, uh, and I'm back to this spectrum that I talked about, the nature of our decisions and, and the nature of asking what's at stake. It is reflected in the question we got. Can, can McKnight hold his position and still be orthodox? My answer is, yeah, mostly. Um, um, and here's why I want to answer that question that way. I think of uh, um, Collins, the geneticist who is responsible for Biologos and these people. Their heart desire is actually to defend what they see in Scripture. Their heart desire is to stand up for the idea that there is a creator God to whom we are accountable. Their heart desire is to try and make sense out of something we've struggled with for a long time, and that is the relationship between science and theology. I may not accept their answer, but I do accept the, the heart that they have in pursuing the question. So what does that mean? I have an in-house family dispute with them on this. We disagree. I attend their stuff. Hopefully they attend some of my stuff. We have conversations. But then let's take that, and this is something that my life has been dedicated to. Let's take that context and that discussion and drop it in the larger world that we function in. There are people who don't think God exists. There are people who don't think humans are made in the image of God. There are people who don't think there's such a thing as accountability. There are people who, who view the creation in a strictly materialistic way in which spiritual things are not only verboten, they are destructive. In my mind, McKnight and Biologos are allies in that conversation. And I never want to forget that. As I interact with them, and as I dialogue with them, and as we challenge one another. Yeah, that's very helpful. Yeah, please ask your question. Dr. Bach, thank you very much. And uh, I love your commentary on Luke, very helpful uh, when I preach through it. I, I'm not gonna ask you to defend a position that's not yours, but my question is the connection between historical Adam and the nature of evil. Um, I'm influenced by Francis Schaeffer, Genesis, Space and Time. And my observation is both in the US and when I lived in Europe, is that when you disconnect historical Adam from evil, then evil gets redefined by the present culture, whether it's utilitarian ethics, economics, class warfare, such as Governor Cuomo just recently, uh, two days ago, said billionaires are immoral. He didn't use an economic term, he used a spiritual term. And um, my country of origin, Germany, is the, the great example of utilitarianism redefining evil as humanity that's unwanted. So is it possible to maintain a biblical category of evil without the historical Adam? Okay, now, um, I'm gonna answer this saying that my answer 
is thoroughly going to disregard everything I've just done. <laughs> okay? So, and my answer is yes. I think you can defend the existence of evil without holding to historical Adam, in part because of the way I answered the question that was asked earlier, which was an excellent question. And that is, what about what evidence is there for the nature and origins of sin? And the answer is the ground. Now the problem, the problem becomes, how are we going to define the nature of that evil? How are we going to determine what's evil and what isn't? You could, I don't think this would be difficult, deny the existence of historical Adam and still say the Bible gives us a very clear picture about what's moral and what isn't. I don't have to have historical Adam to have all those discussions on morality and all the topics about morality that the Bible covers. So I think it's possible to get there without it. Um, I think it's more, now, now back into my comfort world, I think it's more consistent to think about a historical Adam at the beginning of this process. But I don't think an abs it's an absolute necessity in order to maintain the case for it. Any others? Uh, we've got one here. We've got till 12.30. We don't have to go to 12.30, uh, but we have the time if there are further questions. So John Walton has a different methodology than you did, and I was wondering what you think about his. You addressed Jewish post-Genesis 1 to 11 texts and their interpretation of Genesis 1 to 11. How do you, or do you at all, think it's valid to use other comparative ancient Near Eastern texts to understand Genesis 1 I think it's 1 -1? absolutely valid, provided you also take note of how Israelite worldview is so different than the ancient Near East around it. That's the short answer to the question. My problem with his handling of the archetypal category is precisely that. That in the midst of looking at some similarities and overlaps that do exist, there are significant differences that also exist that make the Israelite story probably not just uh, a fit and similar to what's going on in the ancient Near Eastern uh, context, but a polemic against it. So um, I think that's underdeveloped and, uh, and a problem. Uh, and the reason I didn't go there is because I'm, I'm not, I don't consider myself a Semitic scholar. And so I didn't go there. But I know people working in those texts who will say that Walton has given us one side of that equation. And I think they're right. Let me conclude with this question, Daryl, putting it in a bit of a broader historical, longer historical context. In light of the way in which you described how you engage, uh, consider um, them allies, uh, you know, the biologos, et cetera. Whereas I think in many evangelical churches, they're, they're considered enemies. And so what happens then is we, my sense, there can be a tendency not to engage and to become more insular and maybe sep separating from addressing those kinds of issues. So how much of this is a sort of um, a redo of the modernist fundamentalist uh, controversy of 100 years ago uh, amongst, amongst us as evangelicals anyway, if at all? That's a great question. Um, of course. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Here's my hope. My hope would be that we would not replay the fundamentalist modernist controversy. Um, in part by how we respond to these kinds of challenges. And the reason I say that is because for all the complaining that we do about what liberalism, or however you want to describe it, has injected into our understanding, there are some things that they've injected into our understanding that we needed to understand. And so, um, I am a deep believer in a serious kind of engagement that is not an all or nothing enterprise. And my hope would be that we could 
be discerning in what we need to pay attention to and what's worth talking about, where we differ and why, and not overplay the nature of our differences. And I'm talking about with Biologos in particular. Because we have a lot with them that we share. Now, there is a consistency here that I think is at the heart of the argument that produces the passion of the dispute. That is worth having and holding on to. But to the degree to which it is relevant in this big picture that I'm also talking about. Because what we tend to do is to take it and make a huge brush. We tend in our circles to be so afraid of the slippery slope that we never get on the hill. And um, I think that uh, in, in some cases, slippery slope arguments are not automatic if you're discerning and are an exercise of a kind of fear tactic that take you away from really looking at whatever it is you're dealing with if you're not careful. And so my hope would be that we could, that we can, we can figure out a way to have these kinds of conversations in which we're honest about the nature of our differing convictions and what we hold and why and what we think is at stake, but that we take that step back and say, you know, that's, that's in our world, that dispute. That is, that is a dispute about our world and the way we see our world. And that is a dispute that certainly does impact the way we might interact with the larger world. But the dispute we have with the larger world is of a completely different kind and nature. And we need to recognize that when we enter into that sphere, we are closer, far closer to one another than we are to them. Thank you. Uh, well, let's thank uh, Dr. Bach.